I like how he puts these things together because a flood could in one place destroy something but should water be on the redwoods in california their problem would be solved it's like we have everything we need but we don't always have it in the right place when i read it what i thought of was like joy and grief existing in the same spot welcome to book therapy i'm your host kim Patton. there's no way to count how many books are floating around in this world some are decent some are truly terrible and some are great Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one great book. Together, we will discover gems of truth and encouragement to help you face your current season of life. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's get this party started. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Book Therapy. I have a special return guest for you today. But before we get to that, I just wanted to let you know that my audiobook for Nothing Wasted is now available. I will put a link in the show notes. It is less than five hours long and I read it. I wanted to record my own audiobook because I love listening to audiobooks that are recorded by the author, especially if it's like memoir and personal stories. I think you're going to really like it. And for those especially who are tight on time and maybe have a long commute or just enjoy listening rather than picking up a paper book, I think that this audio version is going to be perfect for you. It's available on Spotify, audiobook.com, Storytel, Libro.fm, and a bunch of other places. There will be a link in the show notes for you to click on if you want to explore all the different places to buy it. And it is priced very well, very reasonably. So I hope you enjoy. Let's dive into the book. Today we are talking about Above Ground by Clint Smith. This is a book of poems, and I am bringing back a special guest from previous interviews. Her name is Tristan Tuttle and she lives in Ballground, Georgia. And she's the author of A Kudzu Vine of Blood and Bone. Welcome to the show, Tristan. Thank you for having me again. (laughs) Oh yeah. I'm glad to be here. Yes. I'm so glad you're here. I miss you. We used to live close and now we live far-ish. So far. (laughs) Okay. So This poem book is really interesting because I actually read it because you read it and you read it because it was just like circulating the library as a new book, right? You just picked it up randomly. Right. I saw it like I was on the card catalog thing on their computer. Do they call it a card catalog anymore? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But anyway, I saw it scroll across the front and I like poems. So I was like, I'll give it a shot. And I ended up really, really enjoying it. Um, I never know what to expect because, you know, I feel like poetry is a subjective kind of thing, but I, there was a lot of it that I really did like. So it's less than a hundred pages. It's super short, but it's the kind of poetry that reminds me of your poetry and the poetry that I like to read in that it's very relatable. It's very easy to read. It's not too lofty. I mean, I love my Kiana Lynn, of course, she writes the best poetry, but her vocabulary is like blows, blows my mind sometimes. And I have to look up words in the dictionary. So I love her poetry. It's a different style than your poetry. And Clint Smith, I think covers a lot in this book. So what I want to talk about, I'm going to intro it based off of pages 84 and 85 this is turned in our library <laughs> copies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the title of the poem is called Above Ground, which is the the titular titular poem, right? Am I saying that right? I have no idea. That's a word I've never heard said out loud. I've only ever read. So <laughs> I'm not sure. It's the book that the poem that the book is named after. The last paragraph says, maybe treasure is in what dies almost as quickly as it rises from the earth. Maybe treasure is anything that reminds you what a miracle it is to be alive. I feel like this book encompasses that phrase. He is digging up treasure that reminds him what a miracle it is to be alive. Do you agree? Does that make sense with the poems that he writes in this book? Oh, yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, the whole poem is talks about the cicadas and how they do their cyclical thing. And uh, I know like Some of them go underground 13 years. Some of them go underground like 17 years, but it's all about the cycles. And there's a lot of cycles repeated throughout this book, like life and death, like 
birth, the whole cycle of pregnancy and birth, and then also the cycle of history and what it means to be a black man in America, which obviously I'm not a black man in America, but you get a, you get a look into that from his poetry about people like him from a long, long time ago versus people who walk through life as he does now and how it kind of in some ways is all repetitive. So I liked it. And I feel like this was a good poem to name the book after. Mm -hmm. I like how you use the word cycles, because to me, when I was reading through, you know, and trying to figure out what the themes were, I just kept seeing life and death, life and death, life and death. And this idea of cycles of there's birth, there's life, there's death, things happen, people are here, and then they're gone. And um, he revisits that a lot throughout the book. And so it's kind of sad, but it's also just very raw and real. So we're going to talk about the past, present, and the future. So diving into the past, he has this really powerful poem about, just like we were talking about the cycles. And it's, again, it's sad. He's talking about life and he's talking about death. And the very last line of the poem is, the river that gives us water to drink is the same one that might wash us away. Yeah, I really liked this one. I also liked how he compared a fire to flood. Like it starts with the redwoods are on fire in California. A flood submerges a neighborhood that sat quiet on the coast for three centuries. I like how he puts these things together because a flood could in one place destroy something, but should water be on the redwoods in California, their problem would be solved. It's like we have everything we need, but we don't always have it in the right place when I read it, what I thought of was like joy and grief existing in the same spot where we, all of life is kind of this, it's set up to be compared in general, like our minds create patterns, but also like it talks about um, a soldier across the Atlantic fires the shot that begins another war where the line right before it says that they end a war. It's like everything that ends starts again and everything that starts ends. And like you said, it is sad, but I feel like it's honest. I feel like that's what poetry is, is looking at the the good, the bad, the ugly, but it has to be honest. And I like that. And it's very visual. But that river line was good. Yes, very. So in this poem, I mean, we like how many visuals do we have? Redwoods in California, a flood, a glacier, a drone, a war, cancer, vaccine, funeral pr- procession. It helps us process through all of these emotions and in these the, these cycles of life by him giving us something to like picture in our brains. Yeah, I like the line too. It was just a single line. There wasn't even anything else to compare it to, but it was like the third or fourth line in. It says, two people in New Orleans fall in love under an oak tree whose branches bend like sorrow. Like love is there, but that tree has been there for who knows how long and they've seen all kinds of sadness and survived so much it's like it's all mixed in together and I think our brains like to compartmentalize and say like this whole experience is good or this whole experience is bad and I think what this is saying like the poem's title all at once it's happening all at once Mm -hmm. and I think when we decide to look at it that way we end up seeing a more full and honest picture Mm -hmm. on page 30 he talks about war and he does talk about war a few different times and you know wars in the past have made our history um so he brings it up um he says i do not misunderstand the cruelty of war but i regret the way we talk about its casualties that's a really bold statement because what he's calling out is the individuality of these casualties like throughout the book he says think of that little boy or that woman or that mother he is always asking us to consider the life of one person. He's not ever generalizing them into a group. He wants us to reconsider how we talk about its casualties. Right. I think that this is just a good statement on how we remove ourselves from others' pain. I mean, war is a good example because it feels in our country feels so far away most of the time, but he's saying, you know, I, the, he's talking about like it's a news reporter who's telling and saying that it's unfortunate yet inevitable collateral damage 
And then a little bit further down, it says, and I read his bio and see that he has a wife. And I can't imagine he would call it inevitable if her body were pulled from the rubble. We let ourselves be removed from other people's pain because we can. And in a lot of places of the world, they can't do that. Like you look around on the news now, it's terrible. It's sad, but we have the ability to turn it off and the people living it, they're living it, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just a bad, a bad situation. And we remove ourselves from it probably to protect ourselves. But, you know, when we harden our hearts to other people, are we really doing ourselves any favors? I don't know. Probably not. (laughs) He talks a lot about his family, about his grandparents, about his parents, and how that carries into the future. But in the past, he recognizes all his family has been through and also all of the millions of people who have been through slavery. So is it millions, do you think? I don't know if it's probably millions. I would say so. Just like with the North American slave trade, probably a really long time. I don't know how to quantify it, but um, the poem on page 38 is called And the World Keeps Spinning. And he talks about 36,000 slave ships crossing the Atlantic Ocean. He just mentions how out of every hundred people who were captured and enslaved, 40 died before they ever even reached the new world. And this is his history. This is his ancestry. And so it's really important to him. And he talks later about how it affects his grandparents and what they've been through and then how that carries into his children. There was a couple of lines in this that I really liked a couple of lines up. It says, I try to keep count of how many times I drag my hand across the bristled hemispheres, but grow weary of chasing a history that swallowed me. And it's like, he, this is something he cannot escape because it happened to people who looked like him. It happened to people who are related to him. And, and I feel like, again, this is another example of us as people who are not walking through the world as an African-American person, we can remove ourselves from because it's not in our face. But then there's another line at the end that says a cavalcade, which by the way, I love that word, a cavalcade, (laughs) a cavalcade of ghost ships wash their hands of all that they carried. It's like these, these ships, they're gone, you know, and the people that were on them for at least what 40% of them died before they even got to where they were going. And it's like, Again, that's another way that we can remove ourselves. They wash their hands of all that they carried. It's gone to history, but it's not really gone to history. So interesting to me. And he wants us to remember, he wants us to recognize where we came from and where he came from. And the way that he introduces it feels very poetic and beautiful, but I can tell that, you know, it's heartbreaking for him too. Yeah. Well, he says, I pull my index finger from Angola to Brazil and feel the bodies jumping from the ship. It's like, that's a desperation there. And he's Mm -hmm. looking at it from like looking at it on a map. It's, it's very, it's beautiful and it's terrible all at the same time, which again, I think that's what poetry is beautiful and terrible all at once. Um, But I do appreciate his attempt to, to connect with the past, but bring it forward into the future. Mm Mm-hmm. It's really powerful how he does that. So moving on to his present, which these are more lighthearted poems. Um, On page 16 and 17, he has the Ode to the Electric Baby Swing. (laughs) (laughs) Which, Which he, okay, so he sets up this poem as if he's basically having an affair, but he's not. He's talking about a baby swing. And so, um, He says things like, so anyway, I agreed. And when you first showed up at my door, you didn't look anything like you did in the pictures online. (laughs) (laughs) So you came in and we sat together on the floor. I put on some smooth jazz and I helped you put yourself back together the best way I knew how. (laughs) (laughs) And then the last line. This is an example of how titles are everything. Oh my word. I know, right? If there was no title, (laughs) I would be so confused. I thought he loved his wife. (laughs) <laughs> exactly that poor woman <laughs> and I'm a sucker for the last line but he says oh that's a really long line I won't read that whole line he just says I'm saying you give me something she doesn't and don't get me wrong I love the mother of my son it's just that you make me feel young again 
<laughs> and having experienced a child who refused to do anything quietly unless they were in the baby swing I resonated with this poem on a pretty like visceral level honestly but yeah I feel like titles are everything a poet that I follow uh Maggie Smith I'm sure some people have heard of her she says mm -hmm. that tr you should try to put what the reader needs to know in the title so that the rest of the poem can be kind of experimental you can say what you need to say without saying the exact thing and I feel like this is a perfect example of that because if you didn't read the title you'd be like this man is being inappropriate and that's not cool <laughs> I that's why I think I love novels in verse because they're essentially poems but they tell a story and the title was always um perfect because it just set me up to enjoy that page like it just set me up to like the title could be like opposite and then the the that page is pitting one thing against the other and it just helps you kind of get your ground like you're like okay where are we what's happening poets are so talented at that and novels and verse are my favorite to read because you don't have to explain everything in detail you can kind of use the title and then like you said let the poem be a little bit experimental I would one day I mean my goodness those are my, just my favorite to read I don't know if I can write one but I love them so much. You should try. I have and failed, Tristan. Don't bring up my my uh, faults. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have to mess up to make something pretty. We just have to get started. You know, we just have to it's keep hard. going. Yeah. Um. So on page twenty one, so he's talking about his kids. He's talking about how his wife has gone through a lot right. in her pregnancies to bring these kids into the world, and it, just his experience with fatherhood, and it's really beautiful. I think I quoted this in my book um, near the end when I talk about my children um, on page 21, he says, you little one are not attached to my body. You are neither a limb nor a slice of skin, but you are a part of me in ways I'm still discovering. And when you are hurt, I feel your distress spread through every cell in me. I experience your wounds as if they were my own. It's beautiful. His experience with fatherhood, I, I think a lot of these poems, and don't don't kill me, please, but a lot of them were <laughs> like, they were a little bit too lighthearted for me. Um, some of them are very deep, don't get me wrong, and serious, but some of them seem like just like everyday life as a parent. And maybe it's because I mm -hmm. live everyday life as a parent and I know what he's talking about. It just like, I don't know. It felt very mundane to me. Um, and I like what he does with his words and his poems. I mean, he does them make them interesting and, and fun to read, but I did find it interesting that he could go so deep and so heavy and then just be joking around about dancing with his kids. And, you know, I, yeah. I guess I had a little bit of whiplash. Well, I think like for this, this poem, it's, called, I think I'm not going to pronounce this right. I think, but it's, no susception but it's talking about how it compares it to when a, something bites off the pin, the arm of a squid or whatever and how it doesn't just feel pain there it feels pain all over its entire body and how that's compared to being a parent and I do feel like that it is a simple idea this poem is kind of like the embodiment of that phrase where it's like when you have children your heart's walking around outside of your body mm -hmm. where like you feel what they feel on a on a visceral level in spite of no longer being physically connected and I think that that idea is beautiful and deep in and of itself to compare it to these the animal but at the same turn you know being I'm going to defend him <laughs> <laughs> for a second I do think that sometimes you know a poem is not always for us you know it might be for someone who's in a different season of life and they look back on they see this or it might be like the same poem doesn't always hit you the same twice so like you I may read this now and be like oh it's cute it's whatever but then later I reread it and I'm like well that just made me feel like I wanted to throw up because it like punched me in the gut you know so I feel like that is also another good thing about poems but also just like books and reading in general any kind of art really is that it's never the same to you twice because you each time you experience it you're a different person your mm -hmm. experiences maybe might change your perception of it a little bit okay that was a valid defense 
<laughs> okay, mm-hmm. so let's move on to the future. Um, because he has these children, he thinks about their, you know, future generations and what their life is going to be like. On page 44 and 45, he's talking about taking his children to the beach for the first time. His perspective of life is forever changed because he has this child that he's responsible for and he's seeing life through their eyes. And so things just feel bigger, more important, more, you know, it's changed his perspective. Yeah. Like that last line. In this poem, he's talking about his son and how, like he said, how he's taking him to the beach and stuff. But then the last couple stanzas, it says, I held you as you fell asleep and watched a boy run out into the ocean and dive under a cresting wave. I held my breath until I saw his head rise up on the other side. I think that this is interesting because it's not just about him or his own child. It's about some stranger's child that it's like you become a parent. And even though you've always been aware that there's danger in the world, it's like everything about that becomes more heightened. Like, I mean, I, like I go to the grocery store and if I see a kid without a parent, I'm like, where's your mom? You know, like, I don't necessarily <laughs> say that, but like, I, I'm worried about you. Somebody's, <laughs> you know, somebody's looking for you. It's like, you see the danger differently than you did before. And I think that it's a simple poem. It's, it's not anything earth shattering, but it's kind of like a quiet statement about what changes about yourself when you become a parent okay so speaking of life and death on page 94 95 this is an example of a mundane moment that I think he does really well I mean uh, okay he does the mundane moments really well I'm not like bashing on him (laughs) but you know I do bath time Tuesday Thursday Saturday with two squirmy little girls so I don't know that I necessarily want to read a book about bath time (laughs) Do you, okay. Do you get what I mean? But, but I get what you mean. Lots of buts. Okay. So he talks about dinosaurs with his little boy because his little boy's being curious. And he just asks a question about like end of life. And the author is like struck. He doesn't quite know what to say. And so in this mundane moment, his son is bringing up like the question, like what happens when we die? And of course, I mean, you and I may, we, we may have said something different. I don't know, based on our spiritual beliefs yeah. and our faith, but I, I like what he said. He said, um, I realize how unprepared I am to talk to you about how this will all end for us and how precarious and uncertain our time on this fragile planet is. I tell you that the hope is for all of us to live a very long time, which is why you need to eat your carrots. <laughs> What did you think about this poem? I liked it. I mean, I, I honestly liked most of the poems in this book. I will be honest with you because like you, this is very much the kind of thing that I like to write about because I feel like every day I'm having some kind of existential crisis brought on by a very innocent question or, <laughs> you know, just like a somebody says something and I'm like, oh my gosh, the world is ending. What's going to, you know, like what happens when we die kind of thing. So I got, I got this existential bath time crisis but I liked I liked what he had to say because even if we know it like we truly feel like we know in our heart of hearts you know what happens to us when we die it still is something that is hard to articulate it's hard to explain in a way that a child is going to make sense of because even adults don't understand you know even if they have a spiritual framework even it's hard to be like well as soon as you close your eyes and you're in heaven but what does that mean you know so it's like and there is no no good way to shield your children from the fact that he can't promise that he'll live a long time. And there's another poem where he talks about his doctor's visit where he is cataloging all the things that the doctor said, but then he catalogs also all the things that he hasn't done. It's like, we don't know. We don't know what's coming. We can't say for sure that we're going to live forever. But I did like that. Uh, I tell you that the hope for all of us is to live a a long time. That's why you need to eat your carrots. That made me laugh because I would have said something like that (laughs) because sometimes my daughter, my oldest Juvie, she gets, she gets uh, anxious about the future. And I always tell her like my plan, my plan is to be here for a very long time. (laughs) So I'm going to live forever (laughs) until the Lord says no, you know? Yeah. But it's hard. That's a hard conversation. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so I don't like wrapping this up because who wants to stop talking to their best friend? But um, (laughs) 
we talked about the past and the present and the future. And I want you to highlight, you know, anything that we miss, like anything that you felt stood out to you or any particular poem that was one of your favorites. So <laughs> I had two that I liked. One was on page 103 called Look at That Pond. And he's just talking about all of these things that are in the pond, like the fish under the surface, how the surface shimmers like sound. I really liked that that line. I thought it was beautiful. But he was saying that, you know, one day the pond will become a swamp and the swamp will become a marsh and the marsh will become a forest and how just like the passage of time. But the last um, the last line says, my life is made possible by trillions of tiny mysteries. I exist because of so many things I'll never see. And I feel like that is such a true statement in the way he just zoomed in on one little body of water and then slowly zoomed out like ripples on the pond and how that's what your life is made of like in both the physical aspects of the mysteries of life you know but also like spiritual and your experiences and just all of that I just really like that one and then there was one towards the front on page nine called it's all in your head and this is another one of those things that's like Mm -hmm. more like a story Mm -hmm. like a, a very short story like a little vignette where his wife is pregnant and she has like all these strange symptoms and they keep going to the doctors and they're just like oh you're pregnant get over it because people are very you know that's how they are sometimes <laughs> at the doctor mm-hmm. and it says um they ran some tests and then he says sometimes during pregnancy symptoms arise that don't mean much and sometimes the problem is all in your head and but his wife was like absolutely not this is not in my head and then there's a line where she asks if she can see another doctor and the nurse said no and it says your mother's because re- he's written writing this to his child your mother's restraint fractured she has never allowed someone to tell her the ground isn't there when she feels it's soil beneath her feet i loved that line because one you know medical gaslighting is a thing but two like if you know the truth you know the truth and someone else can't tell you it's not true you know because <laughs> it's true to you you've experienced it you're living it and i just love that confidence that his wife had in that moment because I feel like I feel intimidated in these situations you know medically speaking but also I just loved that he saw that in his wife and it turns out there was something very much wrong with her and that it basically saved the baby's life because she knew that something was wrong and she stood her ground but I just love that line like your mother has never let someone tell her the ground isn't there when she feels it soil beneath her feet the first time I read that, that stuck out to me and I read it to Jared and I, my husband and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. He's like, okay, Tristan, calm down. You get, <laughs> you're real, real excited. I was like, cause it's really good. <laughs> oh yeah. That was one of my favorites at the beginning too. I was like, wow. I mean, scary um, that she had to experience that and that it was, I, I think that we often forget how um, dangerous being pregnant is. Yeah. There's a lot of crazy stuff and no really even, I mean, obviously we know how it works. Women have been doing it for like millennia, but at the same time, there's still so much unknown and so many things that have to go exactly right for your children to show up in the world healthy and whole and who they are. And so it's just, it's just interesting. It's interesting. I had a environmental science um, professor one time who said that if you wanted to really have a crisis of faith you should teach biology and then your wife gets pregnant and then you realize that like six billion things have to go right for your kid to come out normal and healthy and like happy and like when he said that that kind of it made me laugh that's true though there's so much we don't know there's so many unknowns and variables and I'm just grateful every time somebody has a baby and I'm like thank you god (laughs) yeah it's a miracle it's a miracle 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 every time life truly is yeah Something in that poem made me think about your, uh, oh, okay. So when we as writers are reading this poetry, we, we want, like we read to get better at writing and his, his phrasing, his imagery, all of that encourages us to be better at creating a visual for our readers. So I want you to, um, just tell us a little bit about your, um, river woman project because i'm excited for you to finish it (laughs) wink wink come on i am also excited for me to finish it um so 
the river woman project is its draft title because i have no idea what its real title will be but um i am about five thousand words away from my word goal i don't know that the story will be completely finished in that amount of words but i'm hoping <laughs> But anyway, so she is a woman whose family has this ancestral connection to a river where when um, all the women in her family, specifically the first daughter of the first daughter, so on and so forth, they have this ability to communicate via the river. They can hear the river communicate with them. But I didn't want to write it in a way that it was like magic or spooky. I wanted to write it in a way where it was more or, more or less they learned how to hear the frequencies of water, basically. She leaves home, ends up with a very abusive man who, instead of bruising her, he leaves burns on her. And he's got these blue flame eyes. And there's there's a bit of a magical realism element. And she leaves and she reconnects with the boy that she was in love with whenever they were teenagers. And he's got his own tragic backstory. And eventually, she kind of breaks the cycle that started with her ancestors a long time ago with the blue flame guy basically this is not a very good description and i apologize but i will hopefully work on my synopsis and my hook a little bit <laughs> better for next time so we will see the whole my whole hope is that the arc is a redemption story for her that i mean i love a good love story but i want it to be more of a story about her and her coming back into her own and her accepting herself and the gifts that she's been given and letting that be the healing aspect of it, not necessarily the romance, but I do love a good romance. So I'm hoping it'll be a good blend of both. We'll see. I it mean, will. you would think it would be already because I only have 5,000 words left, but it's my first draft. So I'm going to let it be bad and then I'm going to make it better. Yes. I just want to finish the draft. <laughs> yes. You just we'll need see. it to, you need it to end somewhere. And then later you can kind of figure out exactly how you want everything to go but getting the words on the page exactly. is the is the first big hurdle so congratulations on almost being done yes i'm so excited thank you <laughs> and then one last thing is um i will see you at the beginning of march for a writing retreat which i'm super excited about yes. and um, we can sit around in the cabin with our computers away from our children, which to be honest, my husband is not thrilled about. <laughs> It'll be a good bonding time for them and a good uh, chance for you to get caught up on stuff and explore a new idea. And it'll be good for everybody in the end. Yeah, I That's think so. That's the tricky so. part. I think so. <laughs> Just got to get to the end. Yeah. And I want it to be like something that happens, you know, every once in a while, like a writing retreat, I think is healthy for just being able to sit with what God wants me to write about next, because he's putting stuff, you know, in my life. And I just have to figure out what goes on the page and what doesn't. And that's always really tricky. And so it'll be good to have some devoted time to think about that. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So thank you so much, Tristan. It was wonderful to have you back. And maybe next time we can not talk about poetry, or maybe you can just be my poetry guest. I would love that. Thank you for listening to another episode of Book Therapy. Today, we talked about Above Ground by Clint Smith. He is the author of other books, and I'll put the link to his website in the show notes. And also um, stay tuned for Tristan's fiction book. I'm not sure when it will be released, probably, you know, maybe next year. But if you want to check out her poetry book, it's called A Kudzu Vine of Blood and Bone. And the link is in the show notes as well. Alrighty, thanks for listening. See you next time.